I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But a jury said he did, and Clarence was sent to prison for life. How he would ultimately prove his innocence is such an amazing story, you'll think it's ripped from an episode of CSI. Forensic science and reality is deeply flawed. The beautiful rolling hills of Ohio, an oasis of green in the drabness of the Rust Belt. Like many of the good people here, Clarence Elkins made his living at a steel plant. I was a hot and cold forging operator. I was uh, finally able to make a day shift, then the inevitable happened. The inevitable, the cold-blooded murder of Clarence's mother-in-law, Judy Johnson. We had, uh, I would say, an average relationship, you know, any son-in-law and, and mother-in-law would have. I didn't have anything against her in any way. The killer beat Judy so severely, her nose, jaw, and collarbone were fractured. Then the monster took Judy's six-year-old granddaughter to her room and did the unthinkable. And the little girl ended up being attacked as well, raped, assaulted, knocked unconscious, left for dead. Fortunately, she survived. The next morning, the girl regained consciousness and left a chilling voicemail for a friend. Still naked from the horrific assault, the little girl ran next door for help. Unclothed, blood streaming from her forehead, knocked on the door and told the neighbor that somebody had hurt her grandma and her. And the neighbor at that time told her, just wait, I'm gonna call your mother. But for some strange reason, the neighbor left the girl on her doorstep for 45 minutes before taking her to her mother. When a child appears on your front step in that way, why wouldn't you invite the child into your home? Why wouldn't you wrap the child up in a blanket? Why wouldn't you call the police when a child has obviously been assaulted? The girl told the neighbor the killer looked like Clarence. That was enough for police to get an arrest warrant. I remember hearing somebody come up the driveway real fast. A SWAT team swarms Clarence's house and immediately slaps the cuffs on his 15-year-old son, Clarence II. They told me I was under, under arrest for the murder of Judith Johnson, and I just said, what? I didn't even know what to think about it. It was almost like you're in a dream, but you can't do nothing about it. He never had time to process the fact that his own grandmother was murdered. It was disbelief to me. It didn't seem real. And the boy wasn't even the suspect. His brief arrest, just collateral damage in the search for who cops thought was the real killer, his father. I said, well, what's going on? And they said, turn around, put your hands up, and walk backwards slowly. And I'm like, you got the wrong house here or something. And then eventually they told me about a half an hour later that I was a suspect in a murder of my then mother-in-law, Judith Johnson. And I said, you have the wrong person. There's nobody here that ever has done anything like that. And they said, well, they had a uh, a witness, and it was the, the six-year-old girl. In the county jail, Clarence found support from one man who believed in him, Pastor Tom Williams. When I first met Clarence, I said, I want you to look me in my eyes. I want you to tell me, did you do this? And he looked at me and said, I did not do this. I don't even know what's going on. I did not do this. And from that moment on, he had me. Defense attorney Larry Whitney says Clarence couldn't have been at the crime scene because he was at a bar more than an hour away. Although we didn't have an alibi for that time, we had a virtual alibi. We had evidence as to where he was in such a way that he would have had to flu at 80 miles an hour to get to the scene of the crime and back. Clarence stood trial for murder, attempted murder and rape. The motive was the uh, difficulty that he had with his mother-in-law personally. 
There was no physical evidence tying Clarence to the crime scene, but the eyewitness evidence, the little girl's claim. And at trial, her story dramatically changed. Instead of saying the killer looked like Clarence, she told the jury it was Clarence. In my cross-examination of her, was that, that was one of the discrepancies. Didn't you tell the neighbor that it looked like Uncle Clarence? And then later on, you ended up saying, it was my Uncle Clarence. Jurors believed the little girl and convicted Clarence. The sentence, life in prison. I thought, well, you know, pretty much my life is over now. The moment he walked through the prison gates, Clarence knew he had a target on his back. It's not a safe place. With the charges I was charged with, most inmates don't look on that too lightly. I was always having to watch my back. Lost faith in the justice system and lost trust in about everybody. For years, Clarence rotted away in his prison cell. Then a sensational new development gave him hope. Science was about to turn this verdict upside down. His legal team used new technology to test skin cell DNA left in the little girl's panties. We see DNA testing that can be done because that gives you a clear answer, yes or no, if the person's innocent or not. And the results prove the DNA didn't belong to Clarence, but to a mystery man. I realized that somebody was framing me, somebody was setting me up. But just who was framing him? Prisons are filled with thousands of men who claim they're innocent, and Clarence Elkins is no different. Everybody in prison, they say they're innocent. But Clarence is one inmate who really is innocent. I got arrested, falsely accused, and wrongly convicted. An Ohio jury sent Clarence to prison for life in the brutal murder of his mother-in-law, Judy Johnson, and rape of his six-year-old niece. How would he convince the system he didn't do it? Mark Godsey from the Ohio Innocence Project came to his rescue. It right away caught my attention because it had all the earmarks that we're looking for. There was a very shaky eyewitness ID, and more importantly, there was DNA evidence that could be tested. That eyewitness was Clarence's six-year-old niece. She told the court, quote, Uncle Clarence did it. Then in a stunning reversal years later, she recanted her story. I think it was 2002 when she took it back, when she said that she was afraid to go against what people were encouraging her to testify to. Clarence tried to get an appeal on that basis. He was denied. So his team hired a private investigator to identify people in the neighborhood who might be the real killer. One of them they identified was Earl Mann. Earl Mann, a convicted sex offender. Remember when Clarence's niece went next door for help after the attack? That was Mann's house, and his girlfriend had told the child to wait outside while Mann was inside. The girl never saw him. She didn't want to invite the little girl into the house to get another look at her old man. He looked like Clarence Elkins, and he had just been released from prison a few days before the murder and rapes in this case, and was living next door, who happens to look like Clarence Elkins. Look at them side by side. They both have thick eyebrows. And you'll be stunned at what Mann said to cops after an unrelated arrest. Earl Mann had been picked up for a violent crime and on his way to the police station said to the officer who arrested him, why aren't you arresting me for the murder of Judy Johnson? And in an unbelievable turn of events, Mann fell right into Clarence's hands. He was sentenced to the same prison. At first, I didn't want to point the finger and blame somebody without some kind of evidence. Um, so I contemplated on possibly maybe getting some kind of DNA from this guy. And he found it in, of all places, a prison ashtray. After years of praying and hoping, Clarence finally had the key that would unlock his cell door. I seen him putting a cigarette butt out, and um, I retrieved the cigarette butt out of the ashtray, makeshift ashtray, and put it in a Bible concordance I have. Clarence took the Bible back to his cell, placed the butt in a baggie, and sent it to his lawyer. Secretly mailed it out, got it to the lab, and I got a call about a month or so later. We got a 99.9% .9 match. But Clarence needed some friends in high places to get the DNA results to the court. He found a key ally in Jim Canepa, 
who then worked for the Ohio Attorney General. So victim number one, victim number two, forensic evidence um, from the rapes match each other and exclude Clarence. And Clarence had another supporter at the AG's office who would become more than just a friend. A legal secretary named Molly, she eventually became Mrs. Clarence Elkins. I even thought, wow, is he really innocent? And then I was quite surprised that he was actually still in prison and they had evidence overwhelming that he shouldn't have been there. Now, the full power of the office of the Attorney General was behind Clarence's bid for freedom. And in a dramatic turn of events, Clarence was completely exonerated. He walked out of prison a free man. I'm still pinching myself. The real killer turned out to be that neighbor next door, Earl Mann. He pleaded guilty to the crimes Clarence was accused of and sentenced to life in prison. To be part of proving your own innocence from behind bars and, and concrete walls and barbed wire, that's, that's pretty amazing stuff, I think. Today, Clarence and his sons are making up for lost time. When I see him walk out the doors, it's, it's kind of when it set in, kind of kind of went in shock all over again. They're bonding over bikes. But it didn't have the power. Billiards. Ah, and posing for pictures at family gatherings. Your heads are good. But what about the 800-pound gorilla in the room? The six-year-old niece who accused her Uncle Clarence. I still don't hold any ill-willed feelings towards her. She's just an amazing, strong person to survive. And so is Clarence, cherishing the freedom of riding his motorcycle whenever he wants. He and Molly established a scholarship fund at the University of Cincinnati Law School. That's where the Ohio Innocence Project is based. He says he doesn't want another innocent person to be behind the eight ball. I wouldn't wish that kind of nightmare on anyone, on my worst enemy. It's uh, living hell, so to speak. Thank you.